another draft physics video. So Piero has chimed in again and really quite useless. Um, there's just no value to his contribution because his science is wrong. It just keeps making fake arguments. It's like the single slit thing where he pretends that a you know, if you put a, a garbage signal in, you get a garbage signal out. And he just pretends that's not the truth. Um, just terrible. So, uh, you know, we've got something of half of these to play yet, too. And it, but it's just so bad. These, are, these arguments are they're so flawed and wrong in how they're premised. And, and they talk with such authority. Like, yeah, oh, this proves you wrong. And it's... No, it proves you wrong. Just amazing. What people are claiming, he goes on and on about lagging in, in a recent video. Not that I could keep up with a couple hours a day, but... Yeah, it's one hour a day, but um, anyway, um, I can go on and on, but it's sort of an important... Again, the argument is, is that your science has no discipline. Your scientists have no discipline. And, in my opinion, LIGO is just a perfect example of it. It's completely wishful thinking science. It's not... It's just throw out the, the reality book and open the fairy tale book. Um, well, I mean, there's so many things to... You know, we'll end up talking about gravity, but... Um, you know, the LIGO s signal is something like this. You know, it goes... Blah, 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 blah. And it goes this chirp at the end, right? And this is where the two solar masses are supposed to get converted uh, into bent space, you know, or some sort of mega wave. So if you thought about it as light, you could sort of imagine, you know, the, the, if the conversion was into pure photons, not quantons, not anti-gravity. Um, but you could imagine two solar masses converted into photons within one second, you know, or say a half a second. So all of the photons for two suns over their entire, I mean, over their entire existence. So you can sort of think, and, that, and that's not even all the energy in the sun. So just imagine if you take all of the energy of the sun and made a light that bright. So yeah, you could argue that, yeah, even from four light years away, if a light bulb goes on that bright, you're going to see it. So you could certainly say we're going to f see it. I don't, we'd also say that anything within, you know, a light year is going to get fried, but um, you know, you're going to have one hell of a sunburn. Um, but that doesn't explain the rest of the signal. Where? How did you? I, I can see where, okay, where it collides and the two solar masses get converted. Okay, I can see where that's bright enough to hear. But how did you hear all of this other stuff that isn't anywhere close to that? How many solar masses are in here? Where's the, the extra oomph to make it seeable? Because it was just a regular, if it was just 60 suns just glowing from four light years away, you're not going to see much. You're not. Gonna, you're going to have to use your Hubble telescope to see that. So that's not going to be much of a signal. And how come there isn't a huge difference between these signals? I mean, two solar masses being converted into photons should be a huge. Like this should be like a. This line should be from where I am to like New York City. You know, compared to this little drivel. And that little drivel is supposed to be the two things orbiting each other, which is physically impossible without some intermediary, without something making that happen, some other third body that reduces the speeds of the objects. So they don't know what conserv they don't know that gravity is a conservative force. They don't know it's a force, but I'm just saying bent space obeys conservation laws. Um, so any energy that you gain from gravity, if you don't hit the thing, you're leaving. It, you're, you're gone. See ya. 
and so how do they explain this nonsense? Real gravity isn't the stupid spandex thing. You can't throw marbles and they spin around for, you know, a few minutes and then finally crash. No, 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 no. Real gravity is you're not likely to make one rotation. That's real gravity. No matter how you throw the marble, you're not likely to do anything but shoot it out the other side or crash on the first turn. That's the truth of gravity. Well, not the first turn. You might get three or four rotations at best, but that's at a high distance. As soon as you get close, you're spiraling. It's, the spiral is, it can be tight on the edge, and then it, the spiral gets bigger and bigger as you get closer and closer. So you're, the last half of your trip isn't going to last very long. That's real gravity. Now, somebody want to say I'm wrong and correct me because I don't understand a conservative force? Go ahead and explain to me how the energy you got going towards the sun is the same energy that takes you away from the sun. Go ahead and tell me how I'm wrong. That once you pass the sun, you're not coming home again. You're either crashing in or you're leaving. Those are your two choices. You can't find an orbit. You can't find much of anything. And especially if the two things are moving towards each other. So this is the real catch. At half the speed of light, they're somehow moving in the same sort of direction. And they interact with each other. Once they pass each other, they're, 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 <laughs> they're in, the gravitational influence gets weaker, not stronger. They're both running away from each other. The, the, the energy equation becomes, if, you, if we're going to look at it, it's the same energy equation, only it's still the same conservation. But I'm just saying you can just think of it in terms of, well, yeah, it's kind of obvious that if the sun jumped the opposite way when you were going this way, that the gravity just got weaker from the sun, it's going to be even easier to escape. With the LIGO experiment, and, you know, I was tuned to the wrong thing. It should be made to be find earthquakes. <laughs> and... I mean, it's like, like... Yeah, that would be just... I'm just saying there's probably better things to do with the technology. Maybe spy on the Russians and ruin their elections or something. Um, you know, I mean, technically, if they could pick up that initial signal, which had to be incredibly weak, um, they could probably pick up conversations in New York. <laughs> you know, all I have to do is sing a song that goes a certain tune. You know, I play a drum with a certain beat, and then they can program their computer to see if they can find it in the trillions of little signals they, they, they process. See, that's the trick of this whole thing. They went in, they say they're looking for their little chirp. They went in with a, a stupid idea of what black holes do, and then they look for that signal. And the, and the joke is, is they have so many signals that just by the odds of, you know, sh shit nuttery, they're going, to, they're going to end up with something close. Like a seismograph aren't good enough, the ones we do use for earthquakes. <clears throat> well, frankly, I don't think that you could ever make a seismograph too good, can you? Can you have too good a seismograph? I mean, can you really know too much? Wouldn't it be, I think it'd be kind of good if they had this stupid LIGO thing and they focused it on, you know, underneath California and they listened for every little slip and slide. That might be totally fruitful. LIGO. And then just the way he describes everything, and he assumes all these particles and things, and it's like... Assumes all these particles and things. Well, whatever that mush is, it isn't anything I've done. I've, you know, I, <laughs> I've explained what I believe exists and how the things that exist function. And, um, you know, you can either make a counter-argument, but if you want to make just some vague generalization, that's fine. I think everything you think is shit. There. Are, are we done now? I think you have shit for brains. Are we done? He misrepresents and he... Mm, liar, liar, liar. So again, this idea that I somehow misrepresented something. Well, why don't you quote the misrepresentation? Go ahead, point out where I, I, I totally fucked the truth somewhere. Go ahead, show me where I fuck the Wikipedia page or I fuck some scientist's statements. Go ahead, show me where I cheated in some way liar. But no, he won't do that. Because <laughs> that's not the that's not the troll liar way. 
to tell the truth. <laughs> no, it's, it's not how liars win. You know, and also just historically, one of the things, if you're interested in science, you need to redo is familiar yourself. If, you, if you're interested in science, yeah, you need to read the, the book written by the person with a point of view. <laughs> it's always written by a guy with a point of view. You need to read about the drama between Newton and um, whatever his name was, the guy who who claims Newton stole his ideas. Yeah, you learn so much when you read a bunch of pointless drama. The history of science, <clears throat> because it's not a history of all oh, these people fought right and learned the right thing. No, it's a history of a million wrong ideas that got knocked down. And ones that, wrong ideas that didn't get knocked down. That's the big joke here. So that's also part of the history, is the fact that there was lots of notions that hung around for three or four hundred years and didn't get knocked down. Even though there were people who had the right answer and they showed it to other people and no, that, they didn't want to hear that. They knocked down the right answer and they glued up the wrong answer. And that's what you've done, idiot. The hopefuls had great hopes. And sometimes it's really important, you know, things like finding the absolute frame of reference for the universe. Things like finding the absolute frame in the universe. <laughs> it's always there. It's always right in front of you, so to speak. Um, so, but, but um, to, to actually be able to place something in the universe and say, there, that's quiet. This is the non-moving bit. And now you can compare movement based on this non-moving bit. That would be cool, but first you have to figure out what the background radiation is reflecting off. Lots of other questions to be answered first, I think. I still don't get that one. I mean, does somebody have the answer to that exactly? How do you see background radiation when it's going that way? I mean, <laughs> how do you see radiation how do you, it's like seeing photons. You have to see radiation because it bounces off something or it's emitted by something. And if you're saying the background radiation is the, the, uh, the electromagnetic noise from the Big Bang, how can we see it if it's going that way? <laughs> Sorry, I, I just don't get that one. Of all the many things I don't get about the stuff you people say, that's one of the things I just don't get. That was that was hoped for and assumed by people, even. Um, hoped for and assumed. I'm saying it's sort of a, a fact that once you, you know, once you have like an absolute speed, you have some other absolutes. That it seems to me that that means there has to be a zero speed. Yeah. You have a maximum speed, and you have all these speeds that seem to be in the middle, then there's probably a zero somewhere. Because you can't keep piling frames. We know that's not gonna, that's not legal. You can't just keep making frames to frame yourself into a faster than the speed of light frame. That would be cheating. Very disappointing for them. That dream got dashed for a reason. The there's the, what, what history is he writing here? Because frankly, that's that's not part of any written history anywhere. The dream got dashed. Whose dream was that? Well, that it held and pursued that dream when it hadn't been dashed. Um, you know, it's worth finding. Dashed how, exactly? We still don't have the instrumentality. We don't even know how photons are created. And here you are saying something got dashed. When we have a ton of ignorance about the basic mechanics of the function, how could you dash anything when you don't have enough uh, um, of a knowledge base to rule out all kinds of stuff. So nothing got dashed. Oh, you mean because Einstein failed to find a unification theory, it could never be found. Is that your logic? So the guy who was after it, you know, Mr. Whatever, um, I'm looking for the quiet frame, um, the quiet man, yeah. Um, he went go looking, and because he failed, that means no one could ever find it ever again. I mean, this logic is just so <sighs> not useful. You know, why, how they got convinced otherwise. You know, the frame of reference thing is like, it's not a coordinate system, it's the graph paper. There's no designation on that, you know, where the origin is, but it's this graph paper. Right, this relativistic graph paper. So the, the, the paper that ignores 
all the other stuff you're doing and just says, where are we now, me and you? Ah, we're obviously, I'm here and you're there. And so we'll just build a new house here and pretend there's no other previous houses built. No other house we're living in. We're not in the universe anymore. We're just in our little house. And the fact is that everybody has their own graph paper. But if you're going in the same velocity and direction as somebody, you know, you don't have to be in the same position, you're going in the same vector, then you could be said to share. But really, you're not sharing your inertial reference frame. It's just that your two inertial reference frames are totally equivalent, mappable. Um, right. And so this doesn't get to the real issue, which is, if you're going to logically say that photons behave just like baseballs on trains, that is, you both have the same graph paper, you're sitting on that side of the train, I'm sitting on this side of the train, and we're both going 70 miles an hour that way in the train, and we're going to throw a baseball back and forth 30 miles an hour. Now, if you're going to say photons do the same thing, which is, well, like a baseball, they're not really going 30 miles an hour back and forth. <laughs> they're actually going 70 miles an hour that way. Um, and uh, ends up being a total velocity of something like 80 miles an hour in the direction that the ball is thrown. So if, when I throw it, it's 80 miles an hour that way. When he throws it, it's 80 miles an hour that way. And that's the reality. And yet you're saying when it's a photon, no, we're going to change the rules. You don't have to go faster to get to the future anymore. The future, let the future come to you. Some kind of bullshit. Go back and forth all the masses. In a, in a magic little frame. Everything seems, this seems you know, is this a Wonderland, Oz. It's all this stuff is. Inertial frames are just little Oz's where you go and you don't have to play by the rules anymore. Right. So it's an idea you could disagree with, but there's reasons people believe it. <sighs> Who cares? Again, we're not arguing about why people believe the shit they believe. We're arguing in a sense that I'm presenting evidence in defense of my client you present evidence in defense of your client uh, or the verdict of guilty or not guilty however you want to look at it um, but it's an argument and it doesn't really have I don't have to do any of this bullshit where I have to say oh yes you have a perfectly respectable point of view no I don't have to think that at all I think it's a perfectly idiotic point of view and I'm going to argue against it and to misrepresent you know and, and when he's you know, like so again, misrepresent. So again, quote my misrepresentations. Quote where I have done your theory some some gross indignity. Why would two black holes not run right into each other? Well, because they're going like this. They're more likely to miss by some amount, and then their gravity. And, and then their gravity, and then their gravity. Okay, so you just saw him do it. I could play that one over and over again, right? Because it's just wrong. Okay, that's just, you know, grammar school understanding. Real gravity don't work like that. Real gravity isn't this silly little, you know, the, 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 the bent spandex. It doesn't work that way. See, it's no fun, real gravity, because if they did the spandex thing and they actually got the gravity right and got rid of the friction and everything, the little kids would be totally disappointed because they throw their marbles and they just keep hitting the middle thing or keep flying out the other end. And the little kids get pissed off. Oh, this ain't no fun. <laughs> you know. But that's real gravity. Real gravity, you don't find an orbit. You can't, in real gravity, I, there's no way I could throw something into the gravity well. And unless it hits something, I can't get it to go into an orbit just can't do it unless the orbit is the very outside ring so unless I threw it exactly as big as where I am located in the gravity well right on the circumference of of this loop and I threw it right on that edge that's the only place I could throw it to get a sustained orbit without having to hit something inside here to reduce my speed. If I don't reduce my speed, I'm leaving or I'm crashing. You're either just going to do something like this or you're going to do something like, you know, bend a little and right out the other side. That's reality. They're more likely to miss by some amount and then the gravity. 
The fact is, those. <laughs> the fact is. So he said, the fact is. That's not the fact. So I'm just, there's, there's no, again, gravity doesn't work that way. It's a conservative force. I have to keep saying that, but apparently. So I'm just saying, as soon as something passes, um, and it's gained the velocity it gained to start moving towards, as it passes, it'll have exactly the same momentum to leave. And that's just the truth. Holes did collide. I mean, it created such a mass and an explosion of energy that this can be seen as a disappearance of gravity, right? When it... A disappearance of gravity. So again, let's understand. The signal is recording the spiraling. So the two things are spiraling around each other, however they're doing that. <laughs> you know, this wishy-washy spirally thing. So they could do 10 or 20 of those little spinny things and then they crash. So how come we can see the spinning part? There's not two solar masses being expelled there. That's not a bright light. How come we can see it? Uh, we won't get any answer to that question. Um, yes, we won't get any answer to that question. And again, I've, the obvious questions are, what, what, who, who invented the theory that you can convert matter into gravity? And if you're going to be converting it into gravity, uh, I'll, you know, I'll explain something again, obvious, kind of obvious to you. But see, when matter is in the form of matter, it creates the attractive force. If you convert the matter into force, that means you're going to create a repulsive force, not a retractive force. So it's going to be an anti-gravity wave, not a gravity wave. You're not going to be pulling something towards the black holes when you expel their mass. Expelling their mass reduces their gravity, and all you're really doing is creating some sort of radiation that will push whatever it hits. Oh, man, you people are just so dumb. When a bunch of mass, the mass of, you know, whatever it is, I think it was huge, thousands of times more than our whole solar system, something like that. <clears throat> no, it wasn't. Okay, it was 30 and 30. 32, 36 and 30 solar masses. So it was a total of 64 solar masses, and two of them were converted into bent space. And again... If the conversion was at the end, <laughs> this signal should be, this little peak should have been 7 million times higher than this. About 7 million. Whatever it was, but an amazing amount of mass. Turned in. It wasn't really, it's not really amazing, is it? I mean, is 60 suns an amazing amount? Energy all at once from this collision. Right, now that's amazing. Two, yeah, that's right. That's one bright light. I, like I said, take two suns for their and all the light they produce in their entire existence, and triple it because obviously most suns don't stay burning. But if you burned every bit, so triple the lifetime of the sun, and then make it two suns worth, and all of those photons released in one half second. Yes, that's one bright motherfucking light. And again, their argument is it didn't bother anybody. <laughs> you know, all the people looking at it didn't go blind. Amazing. Didn't bother any of the other systems. Didn't bother anything. Alpha Centauri, fine. Everybody was just fine. Well, that's a bad example because it's so close to us. But all the little things close to it weren't shattered, weren't completely annihilated by this flame <laughs> this this huge flame that came shooting out at them and the gravity disappears and the fact that that would create a ripple in something that detects gravity like a pendulum well again gravity disappears so again if you're going to say it's disappearing if that's going to be your argument then yes you've just thrown out the conservation rules and you've basically just said no uh, we can create and destroy energy. <laughs> we can do that. Fuck it. That was a shitty law. Is, I mean, it's totally commonsensical. It's just that it has to be super, super sensitive, and especially on Earth, that's difficult to do. 
definitely at the edge of, of what you would try to do. Well, like I said, it's not really difficult if you're looking for a specific sound that has a specific pattern. So that part's pretty easy. But the expectation, okay, that um, first that you can draw a picture of this stupid sound and know exactly what it looks like in your inside of your detector, that's silly in the first place, too. That, that you could somehow um, understand how your device would interpret that thing out there. Of course, science is always trying to push to the edge of what is possible to try to do. Okay, so I mean, like, you know, so now he's going to argue as if because you say that science that states a truth, like black holes exist and they crash into each other and we heard it, that if you critique that or criticize that, then you're somehow against progress or you're against pr uh, experiments and against investment in technology. No, it just means you're against lying and, and being um, pompous and being... Uh, cart before the horsey. So just you're just because you're saying, well, no, let's let's you know, let's tone it down a bit and and find out what we can, we can really know, not what we can make up. Let's see if we can get the answer right the first time. Uh, you know, measure twice, cut once. Yeah, let's do that kind of science for a change. Trying to get governments to spend more and up that limit and, and various things, you know, to be at the edge because that's where they're learning the most new stuff. You know, when Galileo made the... Yeah, they're learning the most new stuff. Again, how to keep you drooling in a nursing home for an extra three years. Yeah, great. Fantastic. Love it. You know, one of, or the first telescope, you know, he could point it anywhere in the sky and make amazing discoveries. You know, but Gary insults or berates Theoria for being so disrespectful to scientists, but he is. And then I okay, so now he's saying I'm as, uh, somehow in the same category, like anywhere even near the same class as the Theora guy. I mean, I said Feynman was wrong. I said his, his raindrop analogy was kind of silly for a physicist. That a physicist would have so little imagination was, you know, uh, bad on Feynman. But I never sat there and wasted my time saying he's a pencil neck knuckle dragging, you know, uh, butt cancer. I never, I didn't do anything like that. So again, just another lie. It's another f completely false statement. There's nothing similar between my rhetoric and the Theora guy's rhetoric. And there's clearly a huge difference in terms of a willingness to debate and argue specific physical evidence, which he won't do. He'll just make silly comments like, uh -huh. What, are you going to dump the photons out of your camera? <laughs> Shit like that. Um, on that. And he says he's not. While he insults him, while he says that it's a damn lie that, to say that he was anything. I, um, no, I, I'm not, yeah, not going to sit there and be in, have some liar. I'm supposed to let you lie for free? Now I'm insulting you by saying you're a lying piece of shit? When you lie perpetually and, uh, you know... With, with a regular frequency, frequency, not a wavelength, a frequency. Other than respectful. You know, and then he says, oh, it's just the draft science. You know, I'm just asking what if. He's not asking what if, he's asking. Uh -huh. I never said that. I said it's draft science in the sense that I've drafted it. Uh, I haven't glued it all together. It's not uh, completely solid. Um... But it definitely, the draft is a new design, a better nuclear plant, however you want to describe it. Yes, I've got a better model. And uh, it, we're, it's gonna, it beats the shit out of these current fantasy models. <laughs> this is really, you know, at minimum it's a purple, purple elephant instead of a purple unicorn. And what if I'm right? Didn't you say, well, if you're right, then you're right. He you likes that. Somehow that may, would make him right. But if you go, well, you don't seem right. What if you're right? Then, well, that doesn't make any sense. And so I don't think... What if he's right? That doesn't make any sense. But does any of that make any sense? See? So he's accusing me of not making sense, and then he just said something that was just gibberish. You're right. Then fuck you, you fuck her, da 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 you disagree, you could... Uh, again, all of this is just superfluous nonsense. So you want to waste time when this rubbish, and that's all this is, is rubbish. 
So I've made a ton of arguments in the last two weeks about a ton of experiments and pointed out stuff. And I don't, I don't hear any of you arguing what I'm stating uh, the truth to be. Instead, you're just making arguments about some vague notion that, well, one time you called me a liar. Yeah, that's because you lied. I didn't do it in the last four videos, did I, asshole? So, you know, what's the point of responding to a video that doesn't call you a liar by saying, you called me a liar, and that's not right. When I quote you, and I play your video, lying. <laughs> I mean, just being a complete asshole. Comparing me to Theora Apopopops is, is a silly comparison. There's nothing about our styles that has anything in common. He's a pompous, arrogant turd, and again, he runs away from the argument. I'm not running away. I'm playing your fucking cunt arguments. And here you are wasting time talking about arguing. Fuck. Agree with 90% of what Gary says and, and go, well, I think they turn in the other direction, not that 90 degrees, but the opposite 90 degrees, and you'd be a crazy fuck guy that's over a Well, there's some things that matter and some things that don't. So again, this whole idiotic thing that I have to agree with a half-truth it's just stupid. Why do I have to agree with half-truths? Why can't I just say, no, that's not right either. That's still not correct. Shouldn't I wait until the it's stated correctly before I agree with something? I mean, <clears throat> fuck. It's just stupid. I mean, a half-truth is no better. I mean, a half-round tire is just as useless as a you know quarter-round tire or a square tire. It's just useless. Crap exists where you can see in Gary somebody who seems like well, he's intelligent. You can tell from these three or four things I happen to agree with. You know, he's figured them out. And he says kind of reasons that you know make sense to me, and all of the ninety other things that he's scattershot on. Well, whatever. Again, more accusations about some scattershotty shit. Again, without any quotes, without any you know citations to where I did all this scattershotty. You know, it's easy to ignore those or think, oh, he'll figure that out or whatever. And he'll figure what out again? So you're just going to keep arguing that there's some kind of truth that you've established to be a truth, that you have some proof somewhere of something. That that I'm somehow just uh, obstinately not accepting the, the the weight and the incredibleness of the evidence you have. And again, all I'm saying is, is look, I LIGO, I'd say, fine, uh, you know, show me. And then, and then the least they could have done was come up with a fairy tale that wasn't in upside down -ia. I mean, you know, if you're going to tell me the three bears, it, at least have them, you know, on the right side of the crust of the earth. Don't have them living inside the crust of the earth. I mean, this preposterous nonsense of these two black holes hurling at each other at half the speed of light that never seem to do anything the whole trip through the universe. They're, they're jetting through the universe at half the speed of light and they don't seem to blow anything up. Kind of amazing that they even met each other. <laughs> but somehow they don't crash into each other or fly past each other. Somehow they get caught in a, a something that can't happen. But the science thing really shows his, the pureness of his hypocrisy. About <laughs> so again, more accusations that you won't back up with anything called evidence. Complaining with the aura is, you know, just a crazy, and all the people with alternate science theories are all crazy but him. He's and so what's, where's the hypocrisy? And I've pointed out why they're illegitimate in the sense that even if you politely request the opportunity to challenge their ideas, they will not give you that opportunity. They're afraid of the debate. All right, I've asked these people for the opportunity to debate their theories, and they don't. They they won't allow that to take place. They don't play my videos challenging them. They don't even acknowledge the existence of the argument. So again, where's my hypocrisy, asshole? And, uh, and I lament this very fact that, yes, I have to be in among these assholes as a category of people, the anti-establishment. So, Piro, I bet, often says, well, I really don't agree with those, uh, you know, pro-capitalist people who are, you know, for gay rights and for this and for that and for that. And so, you know, 
uh, you know, you, what, so that means you have to agree with them? It doesn't mean you agree with them. It means you argue with them. Why wouldn't I argue with them? If I'm arguing with conventionals because they're wrong, and then I know the unconventionals are also wrong, why wouldn't I argue with them? Where is my hypocrisy? Jeez. It would be to my advantage not to argue with them, to be allies with them, to maybe lie to them and say, oh yeah, your ideas are really great, blah, 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 blah. You know, network. And that's what they do. But then they end up just being propagandists who are impervious to arguments. Thinks he's going to have, you know, if he spent $10,000 debating, uh, who's that guy, Neil deGrasse Tyson, that he would, you know, there would be, he'd be paid back many fold on that and could pay back the that borrowing $10,000, he's going to win, uh, you know, Nobel Prize and, you know, my tombstones, it's all going to be figured out in time for my tombstone to say, Pierre was so wrong to doubt this master. And I'm, uh, no, it's not going to, it's just going to say, piss here. <laughs> you know, you got some shit, dump it here. This guy deserves it. That's what it's going to say. I'm going to be writing it, asshole. <laughs> yeah, you're, you're, you're fucked. You're fucked. You're you're ash. You're bel you're under the ash heap of history. The first one they ever thought of the particle kind of thing. No, you're not. And uh, I am the first one who thought of it by including kinetics, which fixed it, idiot. I don't know whether you followed along. Apparently, this other idiot can't figure. You know, the case for reality can't figure this out either. So I sh I'll probably read his comment. I I have blocked him now. Also, yes, mock gravity was discredited in the 1800s, not the 1600s. So he doesn't even know that history. I mean, I didn't know it before I got into this stupid bullshit. I didn't know what Lesage was. Lesage um, took the documents from a French scientist called Fontier or something. So Lesage, it wasn't Lesage gravity. He didn't invent the theory. He, he basically bought all of the writings of this other guy and... Um, tried to tell people, hey, this, this dead guy was brilliant. And the dead guy lived at the same time Newton did. He actually communicated to Newton. Newton actually signed his paper, which he took as validation of his theory. Um, and then later he had a falling out with Newton and, you know, blah, blah, blah. But um, the truth was, Newton liked the idea. But, you know, so you can't even get the history right. So it was first rejected in the 1600s, so to speak. And then it was, again, rejected when Lesage tried to resell it. Um, there were several uh, resurgence of the theory, the, the last which was thoroughly discredited in the 19th century. Thoroughly discredited by what? Feynman's raindrop analogy. So we're right back to this. That's, if that's what you call discrediting something, saying, because I can compare it to raindrops, and raindrops don't do that, therefore it can't possibly work. There's no other way you could explain it because I've turned it into raindrops. So it's like me saying something like, you can't play baseball because um, baseballs are bowling balls, and because bowling balls can't get hit by bats and they'll break the bats, you can't play baseball, or some other kind of idiotic nonsense. It's a rubbish argument. Uh, and so he posts the link to the Wikipedia page on the Sage Gravity, a page I've already shown in videos, and again, I'm not arguing ultra-mundane Lesage gravity. I'm arguing a kinetic gravity. And it's on my website. And so who's being, who's being dishonest to the other per person's arguments? I mean, if this isn't profoundly dishonest to the work I have done and the work I have published, what is it then? I'm not selling Lesage gravity. As stated, I can prove I didn't even know the word Lesage gravity when I um, first suggested this theory. So this is just such a fucking rubbish argument. So, so that's, that's what you call being having integrity as scientists or something? You're, you're, doing, you're doing a proper lawyerly job in defense of science by that kind of a slander? This kind? I mean, you people just plain suck. You suck as humans, and you suck as scientists. If, if it was a shadow, then the size of the thing would be more important than the density. No, the density would be dark. Okay. Whatever that means. 
<laughs> the size of things is more important than well look density is going to be important to how much gravity you produce and um, you know that's just the truth the math doesn't work out for those things yes it does work out so he keeps saying the math doesn't work out that's and, and so why did they ever call it mock gravity if the math doesn't work why'd they call it mock gravity I mean the only part that doesn't work again is when you take it out into regular space and you end up with the friction problem but for just doing um, gravity equations if you assume no friction which is the reality that we all see um, it works fine so just keep lying about it okay I, what, what else can I call these but lies I mean Feynman said it and you're still going to pretend he didn't say it you know he said it's a great theory it does it all except it doesn't work okay that's a the, the the joke line, but it doesn't work because it and, it and he says the words because it creates other problems. In this lecture, he says that it doesn't work because it has other flaws. He even goes into a whole explanation that sometimes you have a theory, and it covers everything, but there's these things it does other places. There's consequences, and the consequences would ruin it. He even goes through that kind of an explanation. So, so you're just sitting there basically, you know, telling Feynman he's an asshole for suggesting that the theory works. It's like, oh, the math doesn't matter. No, the math does matter to other people. The math uh, again, I've never said math doesn't matter. So another lie. I mean, just keep lying. It's just amazing. I've, what I've said is I don't have any conflict with most math. If you're going to say when you convert Huygens into a mathematical um, circumstance where you get to put a 2 in the equation when it doesn't belong there to create two waves, uh, yeah, I'm going to call foul on that math. You know, when you're going to do math on the two-slit experiment and not include the width of the slits, I'm going to call foul. I'm going to say, that hey, that's bullshit math. That's the single impediment math. That ain't no two-slit math, fucker. Doesn't matter to Gary. Fine. So again, he says it again, like it doesn't matter. Of course it matters. I'm just saying the math has been worked out over centuries. Why would I argue with the math? And I've explained mathematical differences. I said I would modify Newton's equation because, yeah, the mistake was is to put m1 and m2 in the same equation because the gravity you make is different than the gravity that's affecting you. And it's induced. So one of them always goes first. The dance isn't equal. One thing initiates. It doesn't matter to other people. It reminds me of this political thing. It bothers me when people on the left or the right or anybody. It's like the American people want this. America, this guy was elected. Now the American people want this. If you can't even admit that two people exist, three, five, six, seven million, hundred million, with all different opinions, categorizing, even as you want to categorize opinions into at least two very distinct groups, and really many more than that, you say, oh, people want this. It's like, that's prima facie. Well, whatever. They also have things called, um, like, surveys, you know, where they actually call people up and find out what they think. And some of those things, polls and whatnot. So, uh, this, this, what's this argument mean? Oh, oh, that's right. Because you're on the wrong side of about 15 issues where the vast majority of people don't want to hear about your stupid, wacky, uh, open border bullshit. Why don't you put that to a referendum and watch it get crushed, killed, and destroyed? <laughs> yeah, most people don't want to hear that shit, idiot. Obviously not true. People want multiple things. The solution is admitting that people want multiple things. And when people go the way they're going now, it's like, no, the solution lies in destroying the people that disagree with me. No, that isn't where the solution lies. And you could go, no. Oh, yeah, like the Democrats haven't been wanting to do that forever and all that other crap. So what is, what is this even, what is this garbage? We've already been there and done the political system for hundreds of years. It's a dirty, rotten system. I mean, Abraham Lincoln was treated shabbily. Everybody's treated shabbily. It's a shabby system. Yeah, well, that's just the way it is. And am I for that? No. So why am I, why am I being slandered with this fucking bullshit conversation? Well, we totally be in it. No, because your children won't go and agree with you. Those other ideas would simply come back. You're going to have to deal with them. But even if you could indoctrinate your children 100% of the time, it doesn't work out. Because you can't kill all of them because they're fucking resourceful too. And they will... 
<clears throat> yeah, well, that is the end game, though. You, you say you can't kill them all, but yes, you can. The idea is to eradicate the bad ideas. Kill the bigotry. We kill the Nazis. Yeah, do that. <laughs> yeah. I mean, so it's, the hypocrisy is, you know, the other video he was arguing about the Civil War and how, um, you know, yeah, we probably should have killed them back then, you know. Right to survive, too. In the history of, uh, the written history of humankind, having this battle and working out that way, and the other idea is never actually dying out, okay, then the next step is, well, but if we can beat off freedom for another thousand years, well, I'm not into that. I want to speed it up, right? And, um... Beat off freedom. So, so he thinks he's for freedom when he's for <laughs> about nine zillion rules. Anyway, that's off, off topic, because it was really... I mean, the freedom to be, you know, eaten alive by cockroaches. You know, I think Gary can tell people what they're, what they're on the net for, because you can look at this guy and find out what it is about, that interests you about a conversation. You know, for me, it's like, I like anybody that's, that keeps going and going. Yeah, who cares what you like? I mean, I, again, it's just totally uninteresting. Why, why should I give a fuck? about this, what you think is interesting or challenging. I mean, that's not the subject. You know. I mean, you talk about this idea that science is supposed to be something. I know that's not what it's supposed to be. It's a conversation about what you like. Oh, it keeps on ticking. I like anybody indomitable that you could say whatever you feel like, they never feel crushed. Now, it's unfortunately such people tend towards an insanity level of confidence and egotism, but that's one thing. Yeah, look who's talking. Right. I mean, how many times do you have to fail before you get the message you're fail prone? <laughs> you know, maybe you ought to temper it a little bit. And then also, I, I like the people that raise a subject. You know, I have many subjects that I like that nobody else even gets how it's a subject. And, uh, and I like having those, but I recognize that it's good to have people that have a bunch of ideas that overlap. Things other people go, oh yeah, I'm going to talk about that, I understand what that's... Yes, yes, it's all trivial and all superficial. So if you actually treat a subject with any kind of depth and actually dealt with the realities that are created, it's, it's like this stupid whole argument, he had this idea for some sort of land tax, and it creates all kinds of predictable, intractable problems. And it's just, you know, it's an, and, you know, just totally unworkable as, as anything you could possibly, that could work. And he sits there and he just, you know, because he just treats it so superficially. It is as a subject, you know, and Gary definitely has raised a lot of the subjects. So, um, he's a display, really, of also what's wrong with our conversation why we need a Gary in order to, to raise the conversation sometimes, um, why we feel like some... Yeah, well, whatever, this is even stupid, too. Y you need me because you're all trivial, silly people. You can't ever get it. You just can't put three or four facts together without go spiraling off into some sort of wonderland. You just have... There, there's just no rational um, devotion. No intellectual integrity. You want things to be true. You, you, you know, you're not looking for the truth. Commonality or common basis uh, just because of a few ideas that come through a fog and they're bright enough, it doesn't matter that there's all these other lights shining out to every fucking different kind of person. Right, well, whatever, this isn't physics anymore, so I'll watch the rest of that later and if he says something physics-like, I will uh, let you know, maybe if I finish watching it. Um, let's see, I am running out of time, so I guess I'll just read a couple of comments to be done. Um, if you tested, so this is the case for reality, if you tested the speed of light and you're measuring the beam of light traveling at a 45 degree angle, whatever, with respect to <laughs> ye the direction of the Earth's motion around the Sun, this would allow the measurement off by as much as 48,000 miles per hour. Yet the speed of light has been tested at 6,670,660 whatever miles per hour. 
with an accuracy within a fraction of a mile per hour. Um, yes, tested by usually some comparison to some other um, force, which is also moving the speed of light. Um, you're measuring light going exactly with the motion of the Earth, the number becomes whatever, and if you're going opposite directions, look, we've already been over this, me and Piero. These figures are calculated by assuming the Earth travels at 67 67,000 miles per hour around the Sun and assuming light travels uh, an absolute reference frame like you say. If you're saying it is true you could never measure the speed of light without taking the motion of the Earth into account. Well you can't take all the motions into account and you have to understand also they're all accelerating frames. So it's like gravity. When you um, induce gravity. Okay, so the Earth moves towards the Sun. How does the Sun create gravity in response to that movement? It creates gravity in the entire surface of the round Sun. So one half of the plane of the Sun, any motion in that direction, so anything that has a vector towards me, that's not going the opposite way, let's just say, not going away from me. Anything that has a vector towards me is counted as the response to this motion. That's what creates the inverse square law. That's why gravity degrades as you go further and further away. Um, so dramatically. is because you're not getting a direct response right back. Same thing's happening with when something has velocity you have this illusion that material objects are moving in straight lines, that the Earth is actually moving a curve, a straight curve. Well, that's an illusion because you can't see all the little bits inside. But the little bits inside are moving this way and that way and that way and that way. Now, they're not moving that way, obviously, okay, because that wouldn't get them going this way in a velocity. But their velocity, what's counted as motion in this direction, <coughs> is motion in this direction and motion in this direction. So you can see by just probability, <coughs> all the ones this way and all the ones this way will cancel out, you know, from the interference thing, remember canceling out? Well, all of those would cancel out into an average that would be exactly the direction the thing is moving. So when you say when you say you know, okay, how much of this directionality you can process in any one moment, my argument to you is the whole reason why light diffracts so much from apertures is probably this very reason. That's what's causing the diffraction, is the fact that the motion is in all kinds of directions. They're, they're not in the one direction. They're in anything in that half of the dimension. Can you understand that? I mean, the three dimensions have planes. Anything on that side of the plane, which includes two whole dimensions. Well, two dim whole dimensions, in <laughs> one and a half dimensions that are can include a whole dimension and pieces of the other two dimensions are, well, I didn't just, I could draw it and then I could illustrate it, but three dimensions is six pies, so there would be three on each side. Okay, so yes, yeah, so it's one quarter, it's one half of each dimension. Um, so anyway, you know, you, you, you just don't pay attention. Um, around the sun and assuming light of the if what you're saying is true, we could measure the speed of light without taking the motion of the Earth into account. To measure the speed of light, you have to have a clock to measure it with, so that in itself is kind of silly, as, as a statement in my opinion. You're, you, can only, you can only measure the speed of light based on something else going miles per hour, let's say, or something else going a speed and then you measure the speed of light relative to that thing and then you can create some understanding of how fast things are going. I mean, fuck. Gary's still lying about the speed of light and how it would not be constant under his dummy model of light. 
Well, again, I don't understand why it wouldn't be constant. I, I, just, I, I know my own theory. My own theory says there's no circumstance where light ever changes. It always is the constant. So it's you people who don't think light's a constant. So again, he keeps arguing as if I'm arguing for some irregularity in light's function when they're the ones arguing for the irregularity. All right, so... He's done here. Nobody will come back with some spammy name, but we'll see. Oh, uh, he posted a link to the, you know, just a stupid video, so I'll have to show that. Do I have any time left? Yeah, five minutes I can do it. All right, um, how to, yeah, so I already saw this video. So it's a guy who makes this, a, a little small interferometer. And, you know, the video is pretty poor quality. Got a little laser beam, okay, uses a kind of a fancy prism for the splitter. One of the mirrors over there. This one okay, now see. the mirrors are like no up. more than like, what, two, two inches away? Once he puts the interferometer in the middle, let's, let's jump to the... Oh, fuck this cut Did commercials. you know the wrong mattress protector can fuck ruin the you. of your mattress? Fuck you. Hi. Fuck you. Fuck, I hate that shit. All right, so it's two inches, no, inch and an inch. <laughs> so anyway, the, see the mirror, see how far it is from the surface here? The other mirror is going to be the same distance. So clearly when you get the two beams, yeah, there's not going to be any difference in the, in the two beams size because the mirrors are only an inch apart. I did explicitly say 18 feet, let's say, that these beams travel. So obviously at an inch, okay, it's not going to matter much. One beam only traveled an inch longer than the other beam. So the amount of more diffraction you got in the one beam isn't going to be very apparent to the eye. You're not going to be able to see the difference. Um, so it's just kind of silly. Well, it's in incredibly silly. Um, and clearly he puts a, a lens, <laughs> you know, in the end of the experiment, he puts a lens in it just to make it diffract. So. He has these little beams, and they're, they're creating the rings already. Um, so without the lens, it is creating diffraction. And this idiot says it isn't. And it is. It's already creating the Newton's rings. And obviously, where did that come from? Oh, that's right. It came from the fact that there's a beam splitter in the experiment. I mean, he's wrong about everything. All right, let's find that comment. Uh, let's see, he says here, the video shows an at-home uh, Michelson interferometer and clearly there's no diffraction. So that's what he says, clearly there's no diffraction. Clearly there is. And he puts a mirror, a, a lens in, in front of the laser beam to spread the beam to make it more obvious. You idiot. <laughs> so stupid. Ugh. All right. All right, that's probably it. There's no point in we got half of the day to do yet. It's going to take me more than three minutes to do that, so we won't bother. But their argument, like I said, their argument is getting worse and worse, emptier and emptier. Just these vague accusations. Um, somehow what I'm saying and what I'm arguing, this physics can be somehow just gratuitously maligned they are the ones that say something. Well, it just spins around each other. The two black holes just spin around each other. It's gravity. That's okay. That's, that, you know, doing something complete bullshit like that. That no gravity, no, no scientific gravity will let you do that. And, and, and he preaches it as if he knows the truth. Such bullshit. 